my intention and my hope over the next few minutes or so is to talk about the church in terms of how do we make or think of the church as a place of peace in a fractured world. And I have to start off by saying I am no means an expert. I, I don't pretend to be an expert, but what I hope uh, will be offered is some questions for us to think about and reflect on and ponder. My first slide is uh, a little bit around some of the areas I'm going to talk about, but I thought I'd first say a little bit um, about um, who I am and my experiences, because I think that helps to locate a lot of where I'm coming from and why I'm interested in certain things. I come from a background of community development, and that means working with others to establish what it takes for the human being uh, in the context of their communities to flourish, to identify assets and gifts, and to also identify those challenges often through structures and systems and processes, through inequalities that don't allow people to flourish. So that's my background. And I uh, worked in communities up and down the country for several years, and I taught it and did research in it. So that's where I come from. And becoming an ordained person in the Church of England made me think about what does it mean to have God's heart in the center of who we are and what we do? God's heart for justice, God's heart for mercy, God's heart for reconciliation, and to see others thrive and to enact what Jesus has called us to be, to love one another in community. And so for the last 20 years or so, that's been some of the work that I've done as well. Within Birmingham, we're particularly interested in intercultural communities and being an intercultural church. And one of the reasons why I was drawn to this image was the beautiful colors that seem to all come together, but don't meld into one color. They're still very distinctive. And I think that is what we are called to be as a church. The very first church in the New Testament, the Antiochian church, was a church made up of diverse people within the context of empire and all the oppressive forces that empire usually contains. And for me, there's some resonance with some of the things that we are living through today even though the context is different. And I think we are being called to be attentive to what does that mean for us as, as people working with and serving others with the heart of God. So um, just, I'm just moving down a little bit. As we all know, the last few months has been uh, quite challenging for lots of communities. And certainly things like the pandemic and the murder of George Floyd has uncovered the fault lines in our society. And as we heard from our speaker this morning, the world has seen an acceleration in tribalism, partisan conflicts and populist politics. Um, and that seeks to, to divide people in different ways based on notions of identity and belonging and protection of wealth and borders and property, all those things. And that's caused so many uh, complexities uh, over resources, over who has the right to define, over privileges and power. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, as the church in the world, what are we being called to be at this time? How do we speak into the complexity, the fragmentation, 
the systemic violence that continues to impact all our human interactions and relationships. And certainly these questions have been uh, a focus for us as the Church of England in Birmingham. How can we find peace and reconciliation within the world, within our communities, before we find it in ourselves first? How can we cultivate new ways of seeing and new ways of being that are an extension of our previous habits, but that are also part of newer habits that enable us to be relational on purpose? How do we start to move away from some of those traditions and structures that we've inherited that we value, but also in this different context is calling us out of uh, letting go of some of those things that we hold firm to and that exclude other people. How do we engage with other groups and other faiths in meaningful ways? And perhaps one of the most challenging ones how do we have a conversation around a fairer distribution of resources, not just within a wider context of society, but those, those resources that we might hold ourselves? So, Lydia, if you could move on to the next slide. So I want to look at it from three dimensions, which you might all be familiar with in terms of looking at things like mission and uh, discipleship formation the in, the out, and the up. Church is not just the building, as we all are all too aware of over the last few months, as we have not been able to meet in our buildings, but it's about people. Church is about people. And if we are to think in ways of being a mediator, a place of a community of peace in a fractured world. These are the three dimensions that I'd like to offer for us to think about this afternoon. Firstly, the internal life. How do we inhabit that inner room? What is needed for us to be perceptive, resilient, and to be open? As a community of believers, we ask ourselves, how does our worship, our ways of being, shape the way that we see others without othering? Some of us here have been very familiar with silence and being ushered into the greater mystery. How do those insights and that touching on something which is far bigger and transcendent than who we are collectively help to shape us as we move through and go beyond some of our current issues? When we think about others and the way that silence and worship and being together grounds us and forms something of our community. We have to think, what are we being called to at this time? I've heard many people say that this is a, a Kairos moment, a, a moment of acute awareness in our ways of being contemplative together in our community. How do we listen to the deep tears and moanings and the lament that comes out of periods such as this amongst those sisters and brothers that are with us? And then when we move out, when our fellowship moves out to be much more embracing, what does that mean? And then finally, I want to think theologically around reconciliation and sacrifice um, and cost as well. Lydia, if you could move on to the next slide. 
So, Micah 6.8 talks about what is being required of Israel in terms of uh, showing mercy, walking humbly. But first it starts with doing justly. That can only come out of a sense of being grounded, a sense of understanding not only who we are, identity being one of the major issues of our modern times, but as people who are filled with love, shaped with love. And the grounding of our being, as Julian of Norwich talks about, is love. Having that grounding enables us to develop resilience, to be prophetic in ways that are about doing the justice, the loving, the mercy, and walking humbly. And in meditation, we rest from thinking about God to being in our own heads, which is a very Western Eurocentric way of being, to being with God and being with others and acknowledging the image of God in others. It is there we find a sense of the beloved, of being loved, and there we can be more expansive to embracing others. Over the last 18 months in Birmingham, uh, one of our organizations, uh, well, actually it's an organization that shares the same building as Church of England Birmingham, the Anglican organization uh, called Chaplaincy Plus, has been putting on a series of Christian meditation sessions. Um, and amongst the, the workers who are around Snow Hill, the large corporations, um, as well as the city workers and the shop workers. And what's been so wonderful to see are the amount of people of faith and no faith who come and use those sessions. The idea of sitting together has had a profound effect on forming a sense of community, a sense of being still and navigating across divides and divisions to go on to having more meaningful conversations about thinking around what is peace? How do we inhabit and embody peace? And I remember uh, many years ago that the whole idea of silence is something that grounds us in our ways of being. I love this quote from Abba Moses, or Moses the Ethiopian, a patristic, uh, from our patristic tradition that says uh, a brother came to visit Abba Moses and asked of, of him for a word and he replied, go to your cell and your cell will tell you everything. And for me, the cell, the inner room, the place where we are with God, as opposed to just talking to God, but being with God and inhabiting that space is the grounding of love and our sense of being called out to confront injustice and to embrace others. Lizzie, next slide, please. Another thing that we've been looking at in Birmingham as we've come out of this sense of pondering is what does peace mean for us? A group of us have been meeting over the last few months to consider what does peace and reconciliation mean and where does it start? And you won't be surprised to find that as many members of the group as there are, there are many definitions of that. And partly it's been around working towards relationships, building relationships, understanding that 
if we are to be an intercultural community, a community of diversity, where culture isn't defined just on ethnicity and race, but on a myriad of characteristics that reflect the image of God in each and every one of us, that we are being called into a sense of being interdependent. And so grappling with that has been something that we've not just done within the Peace and Reconciliation Group, but in the wider diocese. What do we mean by being an intercultural community? And so a lot of that discussion has come to the fore that it is about acknowledging that difference is something that is God-given first and foremost. And that difference causes dissonance. It causes us to sometimes have having to wrestle with what does that mean in terms of our identity, our sense of belonging, our power, our ways of being, who defines and who is able to navigate the various fractures in our society with ease. It means also saying, what does it mean to be a radical, inclusive community based on not just equality, but equity? And that being something that was specifically and explicitly modelled by Jesus. We've had to dig deep about this because it's not comfortable stuff. And certainly the pandemic has highlighted the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on certain communities, but also the disproportionate way that we have almost walked into this without realising that some of our sisters and brothers, although that's always been at the back of our minds, I don't think that the real extent to how they have been impacted has always been at the forefront of our theology or our ways of exhibiting Christian love to one another. And that's not to take away from what's been done, but certainly it's highlighted the nature of what do we mean by reconciliation? What do we mean by sacrifice? And when we talk about inclusive community of we, are we unwittingly entering into a model or a framework which is around alienation, hierarchy, polarization? The letter to the Ephesians describes humanity's self-inflicted wound and Jesus's solution. It says this, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were far off were brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is the peace between us. He has made the two into one and broken down the barrier which used to keep us apart, actually destroying in his own person, the hostility between us. And that's Ephesians 2, verses 13 to 14. And when we recall that Jesus was a person of the margins, a stranger, rather than a person of power and influence, we are led to be much more introspective, particularly at a time like this. In their excellent book, Being Interrupted, Ruth Harvey and Al Barrett look at the various fractures in society. And they go on to paint a picture of an alternative economy for the church's life and mission, which begins with, a, with a, an intention to be transformative in our encounters with neighbours and strangers and all those that are seen to be at the edges of our churches and our neighbourhoods and our communities, and even our imaginations, those individuals 
that we don't normally come into encounter with. Their book offers a different possibility, a different possibility in that what if the margin becomes the centre of everything we did? It's not a new possibility. It's, it's, a, it's a way of provoking us to think, what if we are being called to let go of some of those things that we have held so dearly before? And we seek the peace of the city. We seek the peace of the community. And those edges where there isn't peace in any definable way becomes the centre of, of what we are and what we do. Ruth and I'll ask the question, what does the kingdom, and they spell it K-I-N, as opposed to K-I-N-G, what does the kingdom of God mean? What if we are seen to be one another's sisters and brothers? And if that's the case, that we are our sisters and brothers keepers, how does that, how will that affect our structures? So that this transformative way of being can occur within what we do and our imaginations. The next slide, please. This quote by Thomas Merton says that the peace we seek is already here. And I just want to quite contentiously add question mark at the end of here. And I do believe that as we seek our own peace and seek the peace between us, that peace extends to the wider community. One of the questions Ruth and Al also ask in the book is, what about the Christian church? The spirit-filled community of followers of Jesus, how do we collectively, sometimes unwittingly, enter into these kinds of obliviousnesses, the way that we unwittingly can perpetuate some of these power-related ways of being. And they offer three answers, and I'm not going to go into any depth at all, but I just want to uh, go over them really quickly so that we can think about it. That perhaps what we do is, because we are so engaged with our context, our world, that we, without thinking about it, start to reflect some of the disparities that we see. There needs to be a certain intention in the way that we look at who are our leaders? What are the ways that we exclude other people who live with different ways of being? those that live with disabilities, those that have the gift of different languages, our iconography, what we look like. How are the ways that we normalize things to the extent that we can't see them as a group of people? And what is God calling us to be attentive to? They also suggest that there is a two-way flow as we move back as the church and forth between church space and world space. And part of that dynamic is changing the world to be better. But that takes courage. That takes a radicalness that sometimes we might feel willing to pay the cost for. If our identities in wider society 
are so enmeshed in forms of structural privilege, then might those privileges distort the ways we seek to live out as Christians? So how do we keep questioning those privileges? How do we keep always asking ourselves if we are complicit in the structures? One of the things that I have recently learned is that many Christian-based organizations um, have a historic legacy. Uh, and when they have looked at how that legacy has come into being, if it's been through slavery or other actions that have capitalized on other people groups um, to their detriment, to the detriment of those people groups, they have sought rep to, to be uh, agents of reparation. What would that mean in a world where there is so much inequality? How will that add to our witness as well? And the third uncomfortable possibility that both Ruth and Al highlight is that there are ways at least more oblivious than the wider world that there may be in our DNA as Christian communities, that we believe that we behave and order our collective life in ways that are about justice but actually cause injustice. And so how do we look at those privileges in ways that invite conversation in from other members outside the church in a humble way to acknowledge and to work on ways of truly engaging with integrity, uh, certainly around those areas that we can't see ourselves. So those are some of the questions I think that we need to, to think about. Lydia, can you move on to the next slide, please? So being people of peace, as I alluded to earlier, in uh, Birmingham, we were looking at what does that mean? And so we identified four areas of work towards peace and reconciliation. One being the social, political and cultural divisions within the church and wider society, church in the public square, what does that mean? How do we become brokers of peace in our society? And I think that's about honesty, really, um, particularly around some of the issues that have come up not just around getting engaged with the mutual aid networks that have really just um, exponentially grown and wonderful to see, but how do we speak to some of the structural injustice in ways that are about seeing change and transformation? Racial reconciliation and interfaith work, um, and we've heard a lot about um, that already and we've been pondering on some of that but is there yet a further step to take are there other things that we can do and another area is around the environment and creation stewardship of creation and non-human ways of being there's one of the one of the things that uh, so several of our churches are engaged in is the Arosha. Uh, uh, awards around being a an environmentally aware church building but also how that permeates into our lives as Jesus followers and the commitment to be carbon neutral by 2030 as well so these are things that are coming on the agenda in terms of our life together, but also how we then can speak credibly into those issues in wider society. And finally, 
something that we've been very aware of and certainly in my work in the last few months around dispute resolution and conflict resolution and that peace does mean arbitration and not arbitration to the extent of dismissing but actually wrestling with some of the issues and the complexities of what we find ourselves living with in our world today. So before we break, um, I just want to show you a couple of pictures. Um, next one, Lydia, please. Just if you're not aware of it already, this is a picture from uh, Archbishop Justin Welby's Reconciling Leaders Initiative. Um, and one of the things that Archbishop Justin has been really keen on is reconciliation as identified as being one of our greatest needs and also toughest challenges. Uh, and I think many of us have been a part of uh, groups on reconciliation and interfaith work. And particularly now and going forward, the idea that this work will be ever increasing and needful in a, in a world that for um, many reasons is seeing an acceleration in conflict. And so there's been a real effort to look at what reconciliation means. Um, and literally it means, um, as, as you know, bringing together and healing um, that which was broken, but it's much more than the absence of conflict. And it's about valuing difference, about seeking to transform previous social and political relationships that give life to all in a mutual way. And so there has been developed from Lambeth a number of initiatives and courses to help the church in, um, in her engagement with a wider community, but also um, to start to underpin conversations with other faith groups uh, and, and those of no faith at all about our world and what does it mean to seek peace together mutually. Next slide, please, Lydia. So before we go into to our groups, I just wanted to talk very quickly about the Difference Course. Um, and this is one of those initiatives that we've started using in Birmingham. And basically this has been rolled out nationally um, from Lambeth to look at the power of truth in a conflicted world. And you would have come across lots and lots of different courses, but I really wanted to very briefly talk about this. Um, um, because it is set in a Christian context, it is looking at what it means to follow Jesus by Christians in the face of conflict and to see transformation through their everyday encounters. And the course is designed for church-based groups um, and it has five sessions run over five weeks, meeting at the end of a uh, sort of week. Uh, uh, it has a break of a week after five weeks and then you can meet again just to, just to support each other and to reflect. The five sessions are based on three habits which draw on some of the things uh, that Jesus did in his encounters in the gospel. And that is around being curious, how we listen to other people, listen to their stories and see the world through their eyes, how we seek to value them, how we be present, how we stay with authenticity and confidence with other people, and how we build trust by engaging in our, with our, our whole selves, by appreciating the disparities in power sometimes, um, and also being mutually vulnerable. And, and of course, it takes a while to get there because it's based on relationships. Um, and that's the emphasis on that. 
And then finally, the third habit it cultivates is how we reimagine and find hope in, in the opportunities where we encounter one another and in the places where we long to see change. So this whole idea of reconciliation is quite a key one. Um, and theologically, what does that mean in terms of who we are as a community of faith, as Jesus followers? And I like this quote by Marissa Foff uh, that talks about how followers of Christ should serve the common good. We hear about that all the time. What is the common good? What does that mean? Um, and certainly in British political circles, there's lots of talk about the common good and serving one another. So for me, reconciliation is literally that exchange, that stepping into somebody else's shoes, that willingness to serve another person. Um, and there have been lots of theologians that have talked about what it means, and certainly amongst the political context in the political sector, reconciliation is a big word. But when we think about the idea of forgiveness, of risking hope, of learning to disagree in ways that are mutually respectful, um, it's something that I think the skills of which aren't necessarily taught aren't necessarily entered into easily. There's almost an expectation that we'll know exactly how to be reconcilers. Uh, that wonderful scripture from Corinthians that says that we are reconciled to God in Christ is the beginning of that. And it's, you know, I go back to the beginning of this talk, which is about that inner work of understanding and the recognition that we are identified by who we're called to be in Christ, first and foremost, and everything else that comes out from that, our characteristics, who we, who we are formed to be, our gender, our background, is part of that as well. And in reconciliation, we offer that to each other and to the world. And so the church is a place that enables that offer and honors that offer and encourages and affirms that offer. And as I said earlier, that might not necessarily be the case because either we can't see, or we have through history been formed in ways that find it difficult to open the possibility of another. So Coming onto that, that last slide, going back to what Wolf says, Wolf says that our engagement, our encounters are not just about speaking or doing, but actually inhabiting it, about having this compelling vision, about enabling that vision, that way of living it out, that incarnational way of living it out to impact not just the way that we live, but others around us. And that when we have that richness and that depth of interior life, we are therefore compelled to work outwards to form the larger institutions of society. I like the idea of a Eucharistic celebrations or merely working for change as the dispersed people of God is, is part of all that. It's all these things and more the whole person in all aspects of her life is engaged in fostering human flourishing and serving the common good. Before we go to discuss some of the things I've highlighted and some of the things that have come out in our conversations, I'd like to offer you this prayer. And it's a short prayer that we say at the end of, of our weekly meditation, Christian meditation class or uh, gathering, as I say, on a Saturday. And I thought it would be quite apt as we think about peace and reconciliation as worshipping communities of faith as the church. 
So let's just pray. Loving God, through your Son, you have laid open a path for us, a path of peace and love. Help us to turn to you through loving those around us, that we may become for them places of peace, places of love. Amen. <laughs>